Okay, so we've been working on this problem for a half hour now. You've been considering the question, how much will it cost to fix Marshall's parking problem and how can it be paid for? So what we're going to go, what we're going to do is go around to each of the groups and discuss uh, the problem, some of the solutions you came up with, possible uh, expenses associated with those solutions. I'm interested to hear what you've been talking about. So I'll ask Charles to kick things off. I know Charles, I've taught him a few courses already. Uh, your partnership here, what did you uh, come up with for part A? What did you say, what's the cause of the problem with Marshall? Um, uh, lack of parking spaces near campus. All right, lack of parking spaces near campus. Other thoughts, what, what are some of the other things that you identified as the cause of the problem? Lack of real estate. Okay, lack of real estate meaning what? So the area around campus is already built up. We've got a scrapyard, we've got uh, businesses, apartments. All right. Crack houses. Crack houses. There's, all right, there's, there's not enough space. Other thoughts on the cause of the problem? Too many people, not enough space. All right, uh, where is the problem? And does it experience a variation in spatial distribution? That, anybody know what spatial distribution means? more problematic than other areas. All right. Yeah, so are there certain parts on campus that seem to be more crowded than others? Aaron, what do you think about that? Yep. Okay. Like, where is the parking problem especially bad, and where is there not a parking problem on campus? Uh, I think it's pretty bad where they're going to be taking spots out. All right. So, so a popular lot. Third Avenue seems to be a shortage of parking. Where is there a surplus of parking on campus? East All right. By the stadium. Right, there's plenty of parking by the stadium, but nobody has their classes out by the stadium, right? All right. They need to actually put a few classrooms in the stadium, and then that maybe take the, uh, the sting out. Maybe that was one of your uh, solutions. Okay, so when is the problem? Is there a, a variation in temporal distribution? What does temporal distribution mean, Andrew? Um, time? Yeah, it's a distribution over time. So are there certain times during the day when parking is worse? Uh, put them 10 and 4. 10 and 4. Uh, last semester, if I wasn't here by you know, 9, yeah. 9, 15, yeah. you forget it. Absolutely. Yeah, it seems like if you can always find parking if you're here before 9, and then if you're here after 10, it's going to be pretty tough. And then it starts getting actually fine again, maybe around, I've seen 2. I, I've never had to wander around if I'm coming in after 2, back from the meeting or something. All right, how can you quantify the problem? Think about the, uh, you know, everybody feels that it's bad, but is there a way to actually measure how bad the problem is? Your attendance. What do you mean, your attendance? Well, the people that can't find parking. Okay, so maybe one indicator of it is how many people are late to class or how many people skip class because they just give up. They drive around looking for a space and they just decide to go home and go back to bed. They just gave up completely. Are there other ways to, to decide how bad the problem is? Surveys. Set, set up a, see how many people are circling the lot at 10 okay. o'clock. So you can have counters or a camera that's looking to, to see how many people are denied parking. Uh, somebody said surveys? Yeah. What would that be? Well, I might make it like a student body thing, just distribute it to everybody. You know? Ask questions. Yeah. Well, what sort of questions would you put on there? How many times have you been late? Have you ever been shafted? Have you ever. Okay. All right. Can you think of other ways to measure the problem? How to know how bad is the shortage? I mean, how many more spaces do you think we need? How many spaces do you think we've got? How many how many spaces do you think we need? Marshall, I think, has fifteen thousand students. Some of those are commuters. Some of those live on campus. Some of those are graduate students who are here mostly in the evening. So like, it would be interesting to, we may not even know how many spots there are. And so you know, this is starting to uncover some of the information we need before we actually design a solution is, how many spots are there now? How many additional spots do we need? And you know, this is all assuming that your solution is more parking spaces. Maybe that wasn't your solution at all. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, who is affected by the problem? Students and uh, faculty members, commuters. mostly commuters compared to people who are living on campus, right? Uh, 
Uh, are there other people that are affected by the parking problem? Maybe let's driving down Third Avenue. Okay, maybe drivers on Third Avenue. Your employer, if you work a job before class and have to leave extra early because you know you're just going to be wandering around. I mean, it could be employers that are affected by the problem, spouses, because you're so you're full of rage all day long. You come home with testosterone coursing through your veins. You're so mad. Uh, financial cost of the problem. How did anybody actually? come up with a dollar value of how bad the problem is or how much money it's costing society to have this problem. And sometimes they'll release studies to say like that congestion in Los Angeles is costing the state of California and its citizens, you know, $500 million a year. They'll come up with statistics like that. And the way that they, they estimate that is they'll calculate you know, the value of people's time as they're sitting in traffic They'll estimate the value of the gasoline that's burned as, as vehicles are idling on the freeway. And so and how you could estimate the cost of the problem is you could calculate much the same thing. How much time people waste, uh, maybe if you're having to park all the way down by Pullman Plaza and walk up here, you could uh, add up over the semester or during a year how much time is wasted, the value, average value of people's time, like my time is extremely valuable, your time is just like a little bit valuable, uh, and so on. Um, and you could also add up, you know, the, the, the fuel expenses and uh, missed opportunities. It might be that some people choose not to come to Marshall because they know that there's a parking problem. And that'd be a bad criteria, but who knows. Any other thoughts on things you put down in part A? All right, so what are some of the brainstorm solutions? What did you guys, I don't know your names yet because we haven't done introductions, so I'll just point for now. What did you guys come up with for your solutions? We did a parking garage for one. All right, let me write these down. Uh, garage. All right, what else? Surface lot. Surface lot. Underground parking. Un lot, not log. Underground. <laughs> All right. What else? That's it. Well, that wasn't so much of a brainstorm as maybe like a brain sprinkle or a brain. All right. Three very good ideas, though. Charles, what did your group come up with? Uh, making the existing lots larger. All right. Expand <coughs> existing lots. Uh, make more lots. More lots. All right. And then just create another garage, I guess. Another garage. So we got another vote for garage. All right. Andrew, what did your group come up with? Um, Anything else that wasn't on the list yet? Well, tear down some of these buildings that aren't doing anything. But All right. It was in space. Demolish. Buildings at Mount West College. Ah, oh, so you're saying maybe where the community college is? They, 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 they're not in Marshall. That is prime parking, isn't it? Demolished buildings and more parking. So, uh, has there been any solutions that anybody came up with that wasn't related to just simply providing more parking? Are there? Well, I said that many of the cars that fly and stuff. That's kind of flying cars. Realistic. That's not going to be really a Marshall solution, is it? That's what does. Some schools don't let freshmen drive. Oh, okay. No cars for freshmen. <laughs> Plenty of schools do that, actually. Yeah. Okay, so uh, class timings. Because remember, we said that the problem is worse at certain times than others. If we had more 8 o'clock classes, more 4 o'clock classes, more 9 o'clock classes, PM, then that spread out when people are demanding. Excellent. And that wouldn't, it wouldn't require us to demolish any community college buildings either. The, uh, I just thought of something else, the buses. The, okay. The, I, I start, when I first started here, I took the bus and it got old because you had to walk from way down there. So how would buses alleviate the problem? Like what's well, the solution there? Well, maybe move a bus, uh, uh, what do you call it? A shuttle? Shuttle or something. And also uh, the timings that you 
Because yeah. that's the most biggest problem with the timing. They weren't frequent enough. Yeah. So you're saying that what if there was a shuttle to take people from the stadium lot to the heart of campus or something like that? All right. Uh, buses, shuttle. All right. Were there other ideas? What flying car we talked about? <laughs> other ideas? What do they do? Has anybody been up to WVU? Yeah. yeah. What do they What do they have as a parking solution at WVU? Train. Well, we got like a monorail up there. Yeah, I've never seen it myself. We got a monorail. I don't know how good it is. The campus is spread out. It breaks down on both sides. It's terrible. It doesn't work real good. We have a monorail, but it would work. Like, like that's our solution. But it takes you over all the slums. Slums. It's like yeah. It'd be hard to have a monorail in Huntington without it going through some slums. <laughs> I got to be careful what I say because I'm taping these, uh, just in case, like in some future semester that I'm offering the class, I have to uh, be gone for a meeting or something. So that's the purpose of the, the cameras. So we, we have to remember that we're not doing it. Yeah, no, uh, not class. No, this is just strictly for my own use. All right, so uh, two alternatives and estimate the likely costs and incomes for each. And so uh, what costs and incomes did you guys come up with for one of your solutions? What was the solution you picked for part C? Um, we put taped building and underground parking garage. All right, so for an underground, What are some of the costs and incomes associated with that? Cost and income. How, what are you going to have to pay to get an underground garage? Well, I did a quick Google and readconstructiondata.com, which I can't speak to the credibility. All right. Estimates the national average is just under $6 million to build an underground parking garage. So you found uh, an average value for that. Six million dollars for an average underground garage. What do you think the individual costs are? Rather than just a flat rate, like what are the specific items that cost money when they're building an underground garage? Um, land. All right, so land. Right. Cost of digging a big hole. Excavation. Materials. All right, materials. Probably concrete and steel. Labor. Labor. All right. Upkeep. All right. Maintenance. Good. Very good. Planning. How are you going to make How are you going to make all that back if it's six million dollars to do an underground garage? Um, who's paying? You would buy parking passes. All right. So parking passes. Did uh, when you found that information that it's six million dollars for an average underground garage, did they say how many spaces there were in that average garage? Um, I believe it was for a ten story. Ten story. So uh -huh. that's bigger than what we have. Here. Yeah, that's that's gigantic. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how many spaces you could get. All right. Um, Let's do one more and identify. We've got underground garage. Let's talk about the specific costs and revenues of another idea. Who had a, uh, did you actually go through the cost and revenue of buses or was that something that just, just occurred to you on the moment? Well, let's consider for buses. All right, so if we were going to do some sort of a shuttle plan, what would be the uh, cost and income possibilities? Associated with that. Fuel? All right, so you're going to have to pay for fuel. You need another lot. Yeah, there's a lot. You still have to have a lot somewhere. So uh, land, off site. It's further away from campus, so hopefully the land's a little cheaper. You're going to need buses. Oh, buses, all right. So maybe we're either going to buy them or lease them somehow. You're going to basically, they're running 24 hours. Well, I wouldn't say 24 hours a day, but during the peak hours. Labor? What's yeah. the labor with the buses? Drivers. All right, so uh, drivers, mechanics, mechanics. Uh, labor to build the lot. Materials and excavation stuff. All right, materials 
excavation. Now here at Marshall, we maybe get away with not having to build another lot because maybe we could just better use the uh, the football lot. So right. it's, I've seen it full. Have yeah. you seen it full? Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen every small cans. Yeah, I had no idea it was that bad. Yeah. All right, so maybe we would need to build some more lots. Even you know the shuttle can stop at the football stadium, but it's also going to stop at our new off-site parking facility, which is uh, who knows where. We'd have to look on Google Maps and find a good spot. All right. So what other costs are there going to be with a bus system? Well, okay. So we we're paying hourly rate to the um, to the drivers. They're, they're if we broke the labor down, there's going to be health insurance, benefits, sick leave, retirement. You know, there's a lot of sub-costs associated with the labor. But what about income? How are we going to generate any sort of money to pay for? Permits for the parking. All right, so permits. What else? Charge for the permits. Okay, so uh, like the ridership fee, all right? So, uh, Bus passes or something? Charge. So you're saying that you have to pay to park on the lot and then also pay to ride the bus. <laughs> okay, so you're saying it could be general fund from the university? I think you just put it in the tuition. General fund? Just like you do the gymnasium that I never used. All right, tuition. We could put ads on the bus, right? Like a big ad, billboard for Dell computers or uh, some, something like that. So advertising. Do you think that'd be enough to pay for the whole thing? The advertising. It's probably going to be relatively small. All right. So what this this the purpose of this whole exercise is to illustrate number one, the idea of problem solutions that are sometimes faced in engineering economy, uh, the idea of comparing alternatives. But something we haven't talked about yet is uh, the sequence of the money. When we were speaking of the underground garage, for example, some of these costs are going to be in the present. Buying the land, the excavation, the materials, those sorts of things happen up front at the beginning of a project. That's a present cost. But then some of the costs extend into the future. Think about the labor. If there's someone who's actually going to be cleaning the garage or uh, sitting at the gate and taking tickets, how do we know how much that costs in today's dollars if it's a cost that will be recurring for many years into the future? One of the big parts of this course is considering what's called the time value of money. And the time value of money is a way of considering interest rates or the, uh, the inflation over time and coming up with a present cost for future expenses. So that if you're comparing two different things, Maybe some, one of them has a big present cost and one of them has a small present cost, but then the one with the small present cost has a lot of recurring costs over time. It can be very difficult to compare alternatives when they have a different timing of the amounts. It's easy to say, you know, $500,000 is less than a million, so let's choose the $500,000 option. But it gets more complicated if the $500,000 option also carries an expense of $50,000 a year whereas the other option didn't. And so then you have to wonder which is the best alternative. And so we're going to be learning tools this semester that allow you to answer questions like that. Um, I'm Dr. Waite. I teach mostly hydraulics and fluid mechanics classes at Marshall, uh, but I really do enjoy this engineering course quite a bit. It's one of my favorite classes to teach. Um, let me hand out the list of uh, the notes here. And why don't you slide the in-class exercises back to me. Like I said, I'm going to give you points for those each day. So you've, you've already earned two points. Isn't that great? You've earned 1%, essentially, of your course grade. Yes, put your name on them. Excellent. <clears throat> Tomorrow, I'd suggest that you uh, keep a, a notebook for this class, a binder. Um, having a binder will allow you to keep all of 
the notes that I give you in one spot, I'll return the in-class exercises, and uh, a certain portion of the midterm and the final will be open note. There's going to be an open note and a closed note part of the midterm and the final exam. And so it will pay for you to keep your uh, materials organized. And, uh, your first assignment is due on Thursday. You know, this class is, this whole semester is being jammed into four weeks, which works out to actually 17 class meetings. Let me give you a copy of our schedule that illustrates the whole semester at a glance. It shows you uh, what book chapters to read and uh, when homework assignments are due and what topics we're going to cover on various days. That's the book, right? Yes, yes, that white book there. How much did it cost? One twenty-three. If you buy it at the bookstore, and you're saying you found it for sixty-seven on the the uh, ebook, the ebook of it. Okay. Uh, Forcesmart.com. Yeah. Um, I I think in past semester students have used an old edition of the book, and that's fine. But there are a couple of homework assignments that are slightly different, and so if you choose to use an old edition of the book, it'll be your responsibility to uh, submit the right homework assignments, maybe by checking with a classmate or something. Um, I'm going to print out for you in just a moment the, uh, you'll be doing a little in-class exercise on another group thing and I'll print out what homework one is and I'll give you the sheet that corresponds to that. Uh, so we're going to be talking about cost terminology today and introducing some of the concepts from the course. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about you so I don't just have to point and say you through the whole semester. So why don't we go through and tell me your name, where you're from, uh, what program you're in, because by the way, this class has uh, students from safety, engineering, and computer science. Um, and then we're going to use Excel a little bit this semester, and so I'd like to get a, a general idea of how proficient you already are with Excel. And even if you haven't used Excel at all before, that's fine. Um, I'll be able to teach you enough to do the things that we're, we're going to use it for this semester. And then at the bottom there, just tell me something interesting about yourself, like the time that you climbed Mount Everest, or what your superpowers are, or you know, whatever is sort of unique, or help me remember who you are. So Charles, tell me your name, introduce <laughs> yourself. Uh, my name is Charles Myers, I'm from Huntington, West Virginia, I'm in an engineering program. I am a regular user, I guess. Uh, I think so. You've been through the ring? Yeah. You're senior now, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll be a sen yeah, senior. Yeah, I'm senior right now. Excellent. And um, so about me, I'm working at a Neverwell Construction as a project manager. That's what the my career goals. All right. Do, uh, project manager. And you're doing that this summer, right? Yeah. Great. Have a good time. Uh, my name is Zachary Underwood. I'm from Maine, West Virginia. Civil engineering, sophomore in Ireland. Uh, using Excel a lot already, there's a lot of classes in high school, and really something about myself after I graduated from Marshall, I want to go on to get an aeronautical engineering degree. Great. Um, I'm Evan Petrie, uh, I'm computer science from Ashland, and I'm in the auto So you're in the safety program? Oh, uh, computer, computer science. science. Computer science. And this is your last class? Mm -hmm. Did you already walk across the stage? No, misinformation from the registrar. They said, yeah, you can still walk. And then my dean, my college was like, season can't. And I was like, well, they told me. She's like, please give me the name, because I'd really love to speak to them. Ah, uh -huh. OK. So. My name is Mark Parker. I'm from Parkersburg, West Virginia. I'm a safety student. And 
the same as him. I pretty much graduated after this. This is your last class? Yeah. Well, I've got uh, an internship at Marathon. All right. And uh, I've used Excel a few times, and I plan to jump on the Marathon after I graduate. All right. Uh, my name is Elmer from Moyne County. Uh, engineering, freshman, pretty good with Excel as a part of it. And I'll uh, come <coughs> uh, computer engineering after I get done with school. Great. Uh, my name is Bennett, I guess, in Excel. Um, I'm, uh, I use Excel quite a few times, and uh, I might go to law school after that. <laughs> Um, my name is Josh. Um, I like your MMORPG. It's playing Xbox. I'm in the civil program right now. He's Excel. I'm just for fun. And that's about it. All right. Uh, my name's Andrew from Dallas, Texas. Uh, civil engineering. Um, uh, I guess at Marshall, I'm considered a junior now. And uh, in the engineering program, a sophomore. And, uh, Excel, Pearson, I guess. And, um, uh, that's about it. Um, I'm old. <laughs> Getting older. All right. Well, we've got a good variety of people in the class. Everybody from freshmen to seniors who definitely need to pass the class because they're anxious to graduate, so I'll expect a lot from them. Um, a few important things. Let me give you a copy of the syllabus. Because we're on a compressed schedule for the semester, we have to be nimble, and you have to be accessible. I've been astonished last semester how many people don't check their email regularly. It's like uh, people have given up on email in favor of Facebook and texting. So uh, you can set your email up to forward. If you don't want to check it on Marshall's webpage, you can set it up to forward to Gmail or whatever you prefer to use. But it's critical that you um, make yourself available to the messages I'm going to send out because I'll, I'll send you messages for example tomorrow we're not meeting for class our class will be online tomorrow uh, it's either going to be a recording that I post on Vimeo which is a little bit like YouTube or it'll be on MU online they haven't quite activated our course on MU online yet and so if, if they get that activated then I'll uh, I'll show you later today how to get access to that. Um, but class tomorrow, we won't be here at 9 o'clock. We won't have a class meeting. And so I'll, for example, as far as email goes, I'll tell you exactly how you can receive the lecture. We're still having the lecture, it's just it won't be in person. Uh, as far as you getting in touch with me, you can send me an email. It's there on the syllabus. And I have office hours from 11.15 to uh, 2 o'clock daily. I'll be in my office and happy to help you with homework or answer your questions. And uh, be sure and get on to MU Online, regardless of whether it's ready for our class meeting tomorrow, I will be posting the grades there. And so at any time you can log on to MU Online and see what your class percentage is and your weighted average. And so you'll have an idea of where things stand. Um, the format of the course is most of the time when we meet in class in person here, we're going to use PowerPoint for me to introduce some concepts, and I'll be working some examples on the board. But we're also going to have a, a lot of uh, emphasis on in-class exercises where you have a chance to work through concepts and get practice in class before I turn you loose on a homework assignment. Uh, because our homework assignments will be due with such rapid succession that if you, uh, if you try and do that assignment without any introduction to it, then you might get stumped. And, and so it's really important for there to be a smooth transition between the lecture concepts and the assignments that you're going to turn in. So that's sort of the purpose of these in-class exercises is to transition between uh, the examples I'll work to the homework assignments that you'll need to do. And the in-class exercises that I return to you, remember, they can go in your binder and they're fair game for you to use during our midterm and final exam. So these exercises you have to do during class. And if you miss a class or skip, you can't do them for credit. They're, they can't be made up. Um, sometimes they'll be hand calculations. Sometimes they'll be with Excel. We've got some computers in that cabinet in the back there that uh, we can use if you don't have your own laptop. But if you want to bring in your own personal computer, then that's great. We can put uh, um, 
you know, the, the examples on your own computer, you can work Excel. And um, these exercises, often you can work in pairs or do them individually, and uh, they won't take too long. Uh, last semester, people who are really fast in solving the in-class exercises sometimes, you know, generally will spend about an hour, an hour 15, doing the lecture portion of the course, and then another hour doing in-class exercises. And so if you happen one day to finish them, the exercises in 20 minutes or a half hour, then you can leave before the 12.15, I'm sorry, the 11.15 official end of our class time. Our class time is supposed to go from 9 to 11.15 daily, uh, but the second half of that will be us doing the in-class exercises, and I'll be circulating around, answering questions. And so if you finish that early, you can leave early. Uh, the homework assignments, you can see the due dates on the schedule that I've given you. We've got eight assignments through the semester, and so that's eight assignments and we've got 17 lectures. You notice there's 18 class meetings. Well, one of those is a midterm exam, so that only gives us 17 lectures. And so uh, we'll have assignments due between every two and every three days. And you need, even though we do the in-class exercises, you can work those in pairs, the homework has to be completed individually. And I'll give you a special caution against working too closely together on homework problems. Not only is it uh, considered cheating if you copy someone else's work for a homework assignment, but it's also just uh, it's bad preparation for exams. If, if you don't struggle yourself on the homework assignments and figure it out on your own, then chances are you won't remember it well enough to actually complete the problems on the exams. And so I don't mind if you check answers with other students, but I, I think that it's not okay for you to sit down with another student and work every step of the problem at the same time as them while they're working it. Because inevitably, one of the two people who are working together is going to be faster than the other one. And the one who naturally would be working a little bit more slow will just try and keep up with the other person by writing down what exactly they did without taking the time to figure it out on their own. So it's very important that you uh, put individual effort into your homework assignment. All right, so I want to give you a demonstration of how to get to Wimba in case it is the case that uh, the class tomorrow is on Wimba rather than Vimeo. Vimeo would be easy. You'll just click on the link and it'll start the recording. But because we'll use Wimba a couple of times during the semester, I want to show you where it is. So if you go to uh, MU Online, The internet's slow right now because everybody's uploading grades and checking their grades, and so hopefully this won't be too. What do grades post? Yeah. Tomorrow at noon is when we have to submit them. That's our deadline. Okay. When you log in, you should see uh, engineering economy. So you'll click on that. And for now, it's not, the course isn't fully set up yet. So I'm going to show you a, a lecture that I posted on another one of my courses. So you click on our class, and then you'll see like the syllabus and the schedule. And if we go into a Wimble lecture, you just click on a folder. And in that folder would be the notes for that day that you can print out before you watch the lecture. And then you click on this Wimba classroom to actually get into the lecture itself. And uh, it will take you through a page where you have to um, like check your pop-ups and see if your microphone's working. There's two ways to actually get the lecture. One of the ways to get the lecture is to download it. And so if you click on this MP4, that's a video. MP3 is just audio. But if you download the MP4, what it'll do is it'll give you a file that has the uh, slides and me speaking, and then you could um, you can put that on an iPad or a phone, anything that'll play an MP4, and it's downloaded. If you enter the archive with this, uh, this blue arrow, instead of downloading it, it streams it to you. And sometimes students have, have said that they, they have a little bit of trouble with streaming. And so if you don't get it to work with streaming, you can download it. But this is the wizard I was saying where the first time you access Wimpa, it's going to want to check and make sure that you have pop-ups turned off and make sure that your speakers work. So I'm going to allow pop-ups from this site. Yes, pop-ups are OK. Start the tool. So you just got to wait a minute while it loads Java and gets everything installed. Yes. 
this. I want to run the applet. It's going to check the audio to make sure the audio works. It has to download the component there, and then we'll hear a little something, hopefully. That means it's working. And if you have a microphone installed, you can press down the, uh, what button is the talk button? If you click this, then it, that would uh, allow you to speak. But these are all, we're not going to use Wimba for live lectures. We're only going to use it for recording. So there won't be any need for you to have a microphone. So the wizard is passed, and we'll click enter again, and it'll load us directly into the, uh, the archive. And so. The way it works is you don't have any fast forward or rewind controls as you're streaming, but the slides are over on the right side, and so you can use that as a way to jump back and forth between different parts of the lecture. So you can see the slide titles on the right, and so there will be a start and a pause button here. So this is a, a lecture that I had from a hydraulic engineering class. Charles has already seen this lecture. You want to see it again? I don't blame you. So this is how you can uh, move about in the lecture. We again have a rectangular channel. Yeah. And sure did. One is going to be equal to difference in the channel. Pause. See, like I'll tell you at certain times. That you should pause to work an example. I'll say, all right, so pause the lecture and work this example. So you'll pause it here, or if you download it, you'll press pause. And you'll work the example, and then you'll start again, and I'll tell you the answer to the example. So does everybody see how to access? Any questions about this system? Any questions about the direct step method? You will later, trust me. All right, so that's how to access Wimba. We just had a little online demo there. Here's our schedule for the semester, tentatively. Uh, you can see we're going to do the whole course in four weeks. And we have a final exam scheduled for 9 a.m. on Friday, June 1st. Um, it'll, it'll be right here in the classroom, our final exam. The final exam is worth. 28%. If we look through the syllabus here, you can see that uh, the in class exercises are 17%, 1% each. Homework is 20, the midterm 25%, final exam 28%, and we're going to have a project that's worth 10% of your grade. Uh, the project you're going to be optimizing a pump storage project. You have no idea what that means, but you will, and it's an awesome project that students do a really great job on, so I'm excited to run it once again. So uh, I encourage you to look through the objectives of the course, the description. Uh, it's got the ISBN for the book if you need to get a hold of that still. Um, I don't think there are any more specific policies I need to mention other than just I'll encourage you to read over the syllabus and let me know if you've got any questions. Are there any questions at this point? Well, the nature of the course or how we're going to be operating. Um, when will we know our final grades for this class? For this class, yeah. when will you know? Yeah, I have to take the final, but how long can we expect? I'll, gra I'll grade them that day. And so, you know, I'm going to be posting the grades on MU Online, and so you'll know on June 1st, it's a Friday, you're great for the course. Because since there are only a handful of students in the class, it'll be easy for me to grade that course. Other questions? You're pretty anxious to know your final grade. Oh, yeah. Do you get like five dollars for an A or something like that? Nah. That's what I would have got. It's five dollars for an A. I I could live another so that's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Okay, we've talked about the grading. <laughs> ah, okay. Homework. Those of you who aren't engineers may not have ever seen this special kind of paper before. But you're in luck, because you get to start using it now. This is called engineering computation paper. All your homework assignments, including the one that's due on Thursday, have to be submitted on this special paper. And uh, the reason why is that um, 
about halfway through the class when we start doing the time value of money, you're going to have to do little diagrams called cash flow diagrams. And it's really a lot easier to do them if you've got this special engineering computation paper. And the, the thing about it is that it's got uh, lines on one side, but it's blank on the other. And you write on the side that's blank, and you can see the lines just faintly enough that it makes it easy to write neatly, and you can do scale sketches on this special paper. They sell it at the bookstore, uh, Staples, online they sell it. Um, unfortunately, it's not super cheap. It's like $5 for 100 sheets usually. I, mean, I wish it was cheaper and I don't know why it, they charge so much for it, but it's great and it'll uh, make your work a lot neat, uh, neater than it otherwise would be. So please submit your homework on that engineering computation paper. Do you prefer any certain color? No. I, I've only ever seen it in yellow and green. Big green. Either one's fine. A word about the importance of homework. This is some grade, this is a, some data that shows on one scale, uh, on the x-axis there, students' homework grade in the course, and on the y-axis, their overall course grade. And you'll notice from the percentage, only 20% of your course grade depends on the homework. And so there's a lot, I mean, even if you got zero on the homework, if you got 100% on everything else, you could still get 80%, which is a B. But it doesn't turn out to be the case. There's a very strong relationship here between people doing well on the homework and doing well in the course. And people who do poorly on the homework tend to do poorly in the course. And so it just, you already probably know this, that homework prepares you for the exam, and that's still the case in this class. Even though you'll be doing those in-class exercises, you may be tempted to think, oh, I did fine on the exercise in class. I probably know it well. Definitely do the homework. There's a strong relationship between final grade and the uh, homework grade. Who's the guy in the little corner? This outlier? <laughs> the guy that did zero, almost 0% zero on both. Yeah, oh, well, I think he probably must have dropped out. <laughs> yeah, did one assignment and changed his mind, I guess. So, uh, the purpose of this class, you know, why are there three different majors taking a class called Engineering Economy? The reason why is that uh, all three majors have to deal with projects, have to deal with efficiency, and have to de deal with issues related to the time value of money. And so the concepts that are taught in this class, project management, comparing alternatives, estimating benefits and costs, all of those concepts apply to all three fields and, and outside of those fields as well. And so this is something that actually has the application regardless of whether you're going to be a design engineer, a site engineer, maybe just even a programmer, um, understanding that these concepts can really be helpful in your career. And so how could you use engineering economy in your personal life? Uh, think about and actually write down, based on the, the exercise that we've done and uh, the course description, look over the syllabus, Look over the description and the objectives and write down how you think you might be able to use engineering economy in your personal life. Meanwhile, I'm going to, by the way, if you don't have paper, here's some blank paper you can grab. I'm going to go print out a list of uh, what's on that homework assignment. I'll be right back.
consider, besides your personal life, how an engineering economy can be used, also consider how you might use it someday in your career. And then it's not always about money. What are some factors besides economics that can drive decision making? By the way, since this is a pretty long class, we're going to take a break. Um, so you can get a drink of water, get a snack, get a third Red Bull going, use the bathroom, all that sort of thing. So we'll take a uh, five minute break and we will reconvene. My clock right now says 10:19. We'll reconvene at 10:24 and we're going to talk about these questions. All right? Oh. Is that your work? Yeah. I think it's pretty much good. Alright. So I'm interested to hear what you think about the applicability of this class uh, in your personal life, work, and what factors besides economics may drive the decision making process. So, uh, uh, Aaron. Like engineering economy, how might you use the concepts of the time value of money in your personal life? You got any ideas there? No, budgeting time and money in your All personal right. life. Budget, time, money. All right. Example. Yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> um, it's whatever you can think of your salary, overall increases in wage, um, putting that into a savings account, figuring out the interest in it, and then if you have an idea of how much money you want to like, get in retirement each month or every year, you can plan for that 30 years in advance. Absolutely. Boy, that's a really good comment. Actually, Bennett has actually seen us do that. In first year seminar, we got together a spreadsheet, and we said, all right, if you want to retire when you're 65 and spend $40,000 a year, then how much do you need to have in a big pot so that you can do that? And so how much do you have to save every year along the way? And so that's a very good application of applying these principles into your personal life. Other ideas and thoughts, Elman? Uh, make sure you know what you know to invest in, so you know how. All right. You know, really long it could guide your investment, absolutely. You know, there's uh, savings accounts that pay one percent if you're lucky, or you can invest in preferred stocks that'll pay six percent, uh, but have a little bit more risk and, uh, and everything in between. All right. What about in work? How would you use the principles of engineering economy and, and work, where you're comparing alternatives or time value of money. Charles, what do you think? As a pro You said you're going to be a project manager this yeah. summer, and hopefully after you graduate. How would you maybe use engineering economy at work? Um, just with the different construction options that might be with the, the different buildings. All right. Absolutely. You know, a contractor can decide should they refurbish one building or build from scratch at another site. And one of the hard things to know is which is going to generate the most money. And what makes it even more challenging is that sometimes you can take the money from one project and reinvest it in that same project. And other, other times you have to take money from one project and start something new with the investment that, uh, that is generated. And so an example of that is Apple. You know, Apple stock, they don't pay dividends right now. They keep all the cash that they generate so they can reinvest it in their business. But some companies will actually pay cash out to their investors because they figure they've invested all the money in the business that they can and uh, what's left over should be returned to the shareholders. And so comparing project alternatives is a good application of engineering economy. 
but it's not all about money. And so what other factors do you think might affect uh, the decision making process besides economics? What's that? Feasibility. Feasibility, okay. Time. Time, absolutely. You know, there's actually what's called an iron triangle. And things can be done, you can either have speed, you can have low cost, or you can have high quality. Sometimes you can have two out of those three, but you can't always have all three. And so, you know, sometimes you want to minimize the cost, but as far as time goes, sometimes um, the speed that you need a project completed or a part produced overrides the other concerns. Well, like the tower, the car. Tower. The car, yeah. The, the disaster tower. <laughs> so uh, this iron triangle illustrates that sometimes you know, like if you're buying a new car, it's not always just the, uh, the lowest um, how many cents per mile. You know, if we were all just interested in the lowest cost in terms of dollars per mile, then we'd probably all be driving Hyundai Accents. And maybe in the future I will be, but for now I'm driving something else because it's like the fun factor. You know, fun or the environment is another issue that sometimes people uh, make decisions based on protecting the environment rather than just economics. So an example of that is that the EPA just recently passed laws that um, limit the amount of carbon that can be generated for a kilowatt hour of electricity. And I think the limit that they set was one ton of CO2 can be emitted for every kilowatt hour of electricity that's generated. And that, for new power plants that are built. And what that means is that there will be no, no new coal power plants built in America. The era of coal-fired power plants has ended. I mean, the existing plants can be refurbished, and they'll be used for many, many years to come. But from now on, um, you know, natural gas-powered electricity and wind electricity and hydropower and all those other options are going to uh, be the ways to meet the carbon limits. And so there are a lot of other factors that also have to be considered. And in the last part of the class, we're going to show some methods for comparing alternatives when it's not always just about the money. So how to take some of those uh, non-economic factors into consideration when you're comparing alternatives. So, chapter one in the book. I really would encourage you to read the book. This book is uh, it's easy to read. It's well written. There are a lot of engineering books that aren't easy to read and aren't well written. And although I assign homework problems from them, and I tell students to look up the equations. I don't really require them to read it. But with this, I really think that you should read it. Um, you don't have any other classes right now, right? Anybody else taking a, another class besides this during intercession? You are, really? Which class is that? Writing intensive. Writing intensive? Yeah. I know, you're also taking writing intensive? What time? I have taken uh, traditions in Asia. Okay. It's a humanities class or something? Does it start at noon? One. One o'clock. Well, boy, I stand corrected. Some of you are taking other classes. Well, to, um, to relieve you of the boredom of your other classes, you can read this book. Because you, you'll, this will be your best class for everybody. This is going to be your best class this semester. All right, so chapter one, which you should read, talks about why engineering economy is important. And um, my biggest complaint when I was a student going through school in your position is it seemed like professors just jumped into the material sometimes without giving any context or any perspective of how that applied to the real world. I especially felt that way in math. Like all of a sudden I found myself in differential equations and I didn't know why I was learning those things or how I was ever going to apply them and I never have applied them <laughs> between me and you. Uh, but maybe I would have found a way to apply them if the instructor had actually focused on the applicability a little bit of the content. And so I think it's important for you to understand the context of what you're learning. And chapter one introduces that. It talks about the, uh, the methods that are used to compare alternatives, quantify costs and benefits. And um, it talks a little bit about the history of the discipline. And actually engineering economy as a field was uh, developed by a civil engineer who uh, 
had to come up with a lot of these concepts to help organize and plan the railroads and which railroad lines were profitable enough to be built before other ones um, because not all projects are of equal importance when it comes to generating cash. And so that was the first application of engineering economy was trying to maximize revenue by figuring out which rail routes should be built first. Um, another reason why this course is taught is that ABET, who accredits uh, not only engineering, but actually our safety program at Marshall is ABET accredited, and the computer science program at Marshall probably will in the future become ABET accredited. Um, but one of the requirements that ABET puts is that graduates of our course should be able to uh, consider issues in terms of their economic practi practicality. It says that the profession in which a knowledge of mathematical and natural science is gained by study, experience, and practice is applied with judgment to develop ways to utilize economically the materials and forces of nature for benefit of mankind. So uh, you may have heard the phrase sustainability used before. Now, sustainability is both an environmental concept, but it's also an economic concept. That is that we have resources available, and we want those resources to continue to be available. We don't want to use resources faster than they can be replenished. And so in engineering economy, we can consider the rate that resources are consumed and, uh, and quantify the benefit that they're being consumed. In China, they have a real problem with uh, deforestation for chopsticks. And uh, the, the funny thing is that wood is really cheap. There are a lot of trees in China. And so it, it's, uh, it's easy to cut them down and make them into chopsticks, but chopsticks aren't a real high value item. And so they're using trees that are right now are in our plentiful supply for something that doesn't have a lot of value to it. You know, it would be just as easy to have plastic chopsticks that could be washed and reused. But for now, because the cost of wood is so inexpensive, they're used for these disposable chopsticks. And so that's not an economic, an economic use of a resource. And through the principles of engineering economy, when you consider the long-term consequences of decisions, then you can help to, uh, to, to decide which resources should be used and how to do it with the most uh, economic benefit. So these are the foundations of engineering economy. And the, uh, the photo on the right here, anybody know what structure that is? Let me dim the room lights so you can see a little bit better. Is it in Dubai? It is in Dubai. What's the name of it? You knew, you knew the place. That's good. It's the world's tallest building. Has anybody seen the new, uh, what movie am I thinking of? Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible, right. Yeah, where he's jumping around on the face of that. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. It's a pretty good movie. It's not, it, there's not enough engineering economy in the movie, but still, it's good nonetheless. Um, it's called the Burj Khalifa. And the hilarious thing about it, I mean, in the context of engineering economy, it would, this building was supposed to be called the Burj Dubai, because uh, Burj means tower in Arabic, and it's in the, the Emirate of Dubai. In the United Arab Emirates, there are seven emirates. They're a little bit like U.S. states, except for that each of the emirates has a ruler instead of a governor. You know, like in the U.S., we have a governor and a legislature and judges. Over there, each of the seven emirates has a ruler, and he basically is king of his state, his emirate. Well, the ruler of Dubai is a real go-getter. He's had all sorts of crazy construction, really exciting projects. Let me show you a picture of one. Here's another one. You've maybe seen stuff about this on the Discovery Channel. Now, what's this called? It's called the palm. Actually, there are three palms. Uh, either built or under construction in Dubai. This is the Palm Jumeirah, and I've actually been out on the Palm before. Um, you can drive on it, and then at the end of the Palm out here is a hotel called Atlantis, and there's a water park out there. And uh, each one of these homes has beachfront access, and, uh, and like a, a five-bedroom home on the Palm costs about $10 million. Uh, you can get an apartment here are apartment buildings. You can get an apartment for about, a one bedroom apartment for about $500,000 if you don't mind being crammed in with everyone else. Um, but okay, so the, the leader of Dubai, the, the ruler of Dubai, Sheikh Mohammed, he's called, he's like a kind of a visionary man and he had a, a plan for making Dubai a destination. 
but he overextended himself. He got into a lot of debt, the, uh, the global slowdown that happened in 2007 and 2008. It really hit Dubai really hard, and uh, he ran out of money. And in fact, the, the emirate down the road from Dubai is called Abu Dhabi. You've probably heard of Abu Dhabi before, right? That's kind of a funny name, Abu Dhabi. But um, in Abu Dhabi, they have a lot of oil money. In Dubai, they have hardly any. And so the Sheikh of Abu Dhabi had to bail out the Sheikh of Dubai and pay for a lot of these big projects. And so this big building that was supposed to be called the Burj Dubai is called the Burj Khalifa because the Sheikh in Abu Dhabi, his name is Khalifa. And so it was like, it had to have been super humiliating for the uh, ruler of Sharjah, or I'm sorry, the ruler of Dubai to have this like his crown, the crown jewel in the emirate is named after the ruler down the road who had to bail him out. So that's an example of not applying the principles of engineering economy um, well enough to keep yourself out of near bankruptcy. So in project comparison, the, the foundation of the, uh, of, of the discipline is to develop alternatives, which we did today in considering the question of parking at Marshall. Focus on the differences. And what that means is that when you're comparing alternatives to try and find out which one is better than the other, the only thing that you have to, to compare is, uh, is what's different between the two. Let me give you an example. I, my wife needs a new car, and so I was comparing a, a Toyota Prius and the Hyundai Accent. Remember I mentioned the Accent before. It's a very inexpensive car. And so there are some similarities, you know, when you're comparing A to B. There are some similarities that I don't even have to put into my analysis because as long as it's the same between them, then it doesn't have to be even considered. They both seat five people. And so I, I don't even have to put that on the list. You know, when I've got the uh, Prius and the Accent, and then there's a list of all the different things that I want to compare A to B, if it's the same, then you don't have to even list it. And so. Um, they both get uh, high crash ratings. I didn't have to compare that. They have the, about the same maintenance cost. And so by focusing on the differences, what that means is miles per gallon, the initial purchase price, insurance price, those are some of the things where there are differences. And when you compare construction projects or um, new machine parts that are going to be generated or any kind of a project, what you really focuses on, focus on is the differences between the two. Consistent viewpoint, what that means is time. If you are comparing two different projects where one of them has all the costs now and another one of them has costs in the future, what you have to do in order to use a consistent viewpoint is you have to convert the future costs into present costs. And so you have to take everything into the same time frame in order to maintain a consistent viewpoint. Common unit of measure, of course, means that if you're going to be um, comparing money over different times, because of inflation, the cost of money now is different from the cost of money in the future. And, uh, and an example of that is your parents have probably told you how cheap gasoline was when they were young. And, but that's in dollars then, you know, in 1970 dollars or 1980 dollars. And so uh, a common unit of measure would be dollars in the same year, or if you're working in different countries, a common unit of measure would be converting the currencies into their into the same uh, unit. All the relevant criteria. Um, there are some costs that, if they're excluded, it'll make an alternative look better than it actually is. Uh, and a way, an example of how that's sometimes done at Marshall is they have two separate budgets. They have an operating budget, and they've got a capital budget. The operating budget is things like salaries, um, the maintenance of the buildings. The capital budget is just building new facilities. But then there's another budget, the athletic budget, is somehow mysterious. It's, it's not real clear to me or a lot of people uh, how much the athletic department actually costs the university, whether it's self-sufficient, whether it uh, costs money from the general fund. And there are a lot of places on, a lot of colleges where um, even football programs don't make money for them. And so consider all the relevant criteria when you're considering the cost of something. Sometimes uh, budgets will be off books or will be uh, the accounting can be a little bit creative so that it, uh, 
uh, certain criteria aren't considered properly. Uh, make uncertainty explicit means that when you don't know something, when there's a risk that a cost may be bigger than you anticipated, then you have to really identify how bad it possibly could be and what the probability of each outcome is. And then revisit decisions means that over time, you see if uh, actually the project performed as you expected. So each one of these, over time, we are going to, uh, we're going to consider with activities and, and you'll learn techniques in each one of those different foundations. All right, uh, we've already done that. So here's an idea of what some of, the idea, some of the possibilities were that they came up with in past semesters. You know, I've just looked over what you did for your first in class exercise. Um, here's some of the specific projects you know, if there were more classes in the summer, then that maybe would take some of the load off during the academic year. Uh, some people were saying if you had more online courses, then that would reduce the amount of demand for actual in-person and reduce the parking problem. Uh, some people said that you should encourage biking so people could ride their bicycles to work. You know, they do that a lot in some countries. In the Netherlands, they, everybody rides bikes over there. Carpool website so that you could catch a ride with someone. That would save not only parking spaces, but also money. These are just some of the ideas that they had in previous semesters. I thought you'd be interested in seeing them. Uh, last semester, they considered the off-site shuttle. They thought about uh, what if there was a, a shuttle, where they <coughs> in a lot of detail bringing people in. And so here were some of the costs that they came up with, the expense of having a shuttle. Some of the income possibilities, maybe you could get grants for it or concessions, like you could have uh, shopping at the lots, you know, like sell a coffee stand or something, a little McDonald's satellite in the parking lot. Those are clunkers. Clunkers? Well, the idea was that maybe you could just use junky old cars as the shuttles instead of buses. So their idea was, the idea was, you know, why have a nice bus? You could just get really junky rundown cars and use that as the shuttle around. <laughs> you see all the maintenance guys on the John Deere Gators and just put a trailer on them. Yeah, maybe. You know, like when you go to Disneyland, how they have like to get people in from the lots? It's yeah. like a, a little uh, yeah. golf cart kind of a thing. Yeah. Maybe. I like the idea of rickshaws instead of buses. Rickshaws. Yeah, we get good exercise, wouldn't we? Close the, close the rec center. Don't charge you guys for that anymore, but everyone has to ride a rickshaw an hour a day to shuttle other students around. You'd get exercise, you'd save money, there'd be lots of parking for professors because the students wouldn't need parking anymore. All right, so we're digging into chapter two. We've got about a half hour left today. Um, different kinds of costs, uh, cost terminology. Um, when you have a, uh, a business, then there are costs that can be fixed variable and incremental. So think about what if your business was making ice cream? If you had, has anybody been over to the Cold Stone that they have at Pullman Plasma? Pullman Plaza, okay. Everybody's acquainted with what ice cream is and what like uh, the basic operations of an ice cream store. So activity level is the number of ice creams that they're selling. So think about what type of costs would a business have regardless of whether they sold one ice cream cone or a million ice cream cones. What would be a fixed cost of Cold Stone Creamery down at Coleman Plaza? The lease of the building. All right, so a lease or rent. Okay, that's a good example of a fixed cost. Electricity. All right. Okay, well, that's utilities. Well, put that under utilities. We'll just say utilities in general. All right. Now, have util. That's a, a fixed versus variable. <coughs> if they're selling a lot of ice cream, they might have slightly higher utility costs because you know how the little scooper goes into water that's running? So maybe you have a slightly higher water bill, but for the most part, it's probably gonna be fixed. You don't need any more elect lights if there's lots of people versus hardly anybody coming in. But employee payment be fixed. It could because you know you're either going to have the guy standing around doing nothing, or he's going to be scooping ice cream. So um, salaries, the manager doesn't get paid anymore. 
You said insurance. Insurance? All right. Um, every year that business has to file a tax return. And so administrative costs like accounting, tax returns, you know, whoever's doing the books. Permits. Right. Administrative costs will be fixed, unaffected by the level of activity. Now what sort of expenses for an ice cream store would be variable? All right, so material costs. We're talking sugar, cream, candy bars, and all the other good stuff that goes into ice cream. What other costs might be variable? A certain portion of the utilities could be variable. And so maybe there's a certain part of utilities that's fixed, and then maybe a certain part of utilities. So we'll just say part of utilities because there's a fixed component and a variable component. And the same could be said of salaries. You know, you may only need to have one worker if nothing's happening, but if it's really busy, then you might have to have additional labor. And so we'll say part of labor. So in other words, labor could have a fixed component and also a variable component. So it could insurance because the more employees, the more workers come. Very good. That's right. The insurance could be based on, uh, and there might even be liability insurance. You know, the, the business has to have insurance in case a customer comes and slips and falls. And so a small business probably has, with fewer people coming in, they have lower liability insurance than a business that has a, a lot of traffic. Okay, so there could be a, uh, a variable component to insurance as well. Can you think of any other things that would be a variable cost not something that varies with the quantity of output. Incremental costs. All right. So additional costs from increasing output of a system by one unit. Um, an incremental cost means how much additional cost is there for the business for each ice cream cone more that they sell. And so in a month, let's say if you added up all of the fixed costs, maybe that business has in fixed costs $2,000 a month, maybe. The variable, uh, the incremental cost is going to be how much does it actually cost them for the sugar, cream, candy bars that goes into one bowl of ice cream. I mean, you pay maybe $4 for it, but how much is it actually costing them for that one unit? So who knows? Maybe it's like probably, what, 25 cents? You know, soda, you know, Pepsi and Coke, is famous for having a really low incremental cost, like fountain drinks. I mean, in terms of the carbonated water and the syrup that goes into a fountain Coke, it's probably like one or two cents of actual incremental cost. When you go to a restaurant, you can pay two, three dollars for a fountain drink. Nice or an ice cream, or an iced tea. Cheap there too, right? Okay, so incremental cost. And so we're talking in terms of an ice cream business. It could be a manufacturer, you know, a manufacturer that's making some sort of a gizmo, uh, Apple. Uh, Apple had a fixed cost to develop the iPhone, but then there's also an incremental cost that goes into the components of each one of the uh, devices that are built. And so if you added up all little components in there, maybe it costs them $45, and then they sell them for $49 for the old ones on contract and then it's getting subsidized and so it can be confusing. But the definition of an incremental cost is one additional unit. So now if we think about uh, cars as another example, the average cost per mile of owning a car is a function of annual mileage. So let's think about how much, this is near and dear to my heart because I've been comparing alternatives. The current option, you know, what the family car that I have right now I bought in 2008 for $3,000. I bought it as a disposable car. I didn't think I was going to keep it for more than just one summer. Because uh, back in 2008, I was actually living over in the UAE, and I'd come back to the U.S. just for the summer. We'd drive around the U.S. during the summer and then go back over to the UAE for the rest of the year. And so I looked at how much a rental car was going to cost, and I thought, well, I'll just buy a car. It would actually be about the same price, and then maybe at the end of the summer I can resell it. I didn't actually resell it, I just kept it. 
and then it turns out I came back to Marshall, and uh, thankfully I had a car, but it just keeps running. It won't die. This, this 2000 Dodge Intrepid just keeps running. So it's free, basically. It's free transportation, so no car looks good to me after having that. But uh, think about just your average typical car. If I end up getting a Prius, a new Prius is about $24,000 as an initial cost. Um, and let's say that we're going to drive the average, I think most people drive how many miles per year? 17,000 is the average. 17,000 miles per year. I'm going to assume that the car will last for 12 years. It gets 50 miles per gallon, and gas is four dollars a gallon over the next 12 years. Let's hope. Let's say let's let's say that it is. I'm feeling lucky. Um, so calculate the average cost per mile. Fixed cost and variable cost. So what are some of the costs besides this uh, purchase price? What other costs are there? Um, so there's gas. What are the things that cost you money in owning a car? Insurance. All right, insurance. Insurance on that car, I've looked it up, is about uh, $100 a month. Comprehensive and collision. Other expenses. Maintenance. All right. The what I have been budgeting as far as maintenance is I've been budgeting six hundred dollars a year. Depreciation. Mm, not yet. We will later. Six hundred. I think, uh, oh, there's taxes, registration, so registration, taxes, what will, it, I mean annual property taxes, we'll just assume, although it's not the case, that this includes the price of the, the taxes. And so the registration and taxes is going to be about $200 per year. All right, so what I'd like you to do is write down there in your handout, which of these make a column for fixed costs, make a column for variable costs? Remember, the definition of a fixed cost is something that it would be the same price regardless of how many miles I drive. A variable cost is going to increase or decrease based on how much I drive. So classify them and then try and estimate, based on the data that I've given you, the cost per mile on an annual basis. We'll see if we come up with the same thing. I'm going to run the calculations at the same time that you are.
hope everyone brought a calculator today. You should bring one in every class for you. Uh, warranty to 190,000. What about the uh, your maintenance costs? The, <coughs> I don't think of the motor itself. The electric motor or the gas one? The gas one. 17,000 times 12. You're saying that's how much? 204,000 dollars? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Don't do that. If it was a diesel, baby. Oh, you're being. My Dodge Intrepid is almost at a I was thinking, I thought if you were selling, I was interested. No, no, no. And I will be eventually. <laughs>
everybody else come up with 5360 per year, which works out to uh, if we were doing 17,000 miles, that's uh, 31.5 cents per mile. I do about 28 cents a mile. Did you have a different uh, one of these? Uh, so 2013. I could have made a mistake. I was doing these calculations on my phone. On the yes. You got the same, you got the same right. Right. Of course I did. Yes, I got 1360. Right. 1360, that's what I wrote. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't actually do it for my Intrepid. I don't want to because it's so cheap. It's just going to break my heart when I see that it can't go on. Uh, forever. I didn't put maintenance in there. That's what it was. Fuel, 3,000. Okay. Fuel fat, that's probably an exaggeration. I think I get 25 miles a gallon. It's going to be double the 1360. Yeah. I'll be more accurate on that. It's 2720 for my Dodge. I didn't put the uh, maintenance in People say, oh, I'm going to buy a hybrid because it'll save me on gas money. No, no. You need to keep driving your junker as long as you can because it's only 26 cents per mile. It's cheap, even though my maintenance is higher than it would be on a Prius and the uh, fuel costs are higher. I can basically, you know, with a straight face, say that the purchase price was zero because, I mean, I bought it five, six years ago with the intention of just using it for a summer. And so I really do think of it basically as free. And okay, so if I even 3,000 over the years that I've owned it, it's still gonna be really, really low for the purchase price. So the principle of comparing alternatives is to look at the differences in each category. And, uh, and so what did you come up with for fixed costs versus variable? I asked you to break the costs up into these different categories. What did you say were fixed costs? The price of the vehicle. Okay, purchase price. Uh, the years that you're going to ownership. Well, that's um, not the number of years wasn't really. A, okay, these are the cost categories: the purchase price, gas, insurance, maintenance, and registration. The, I think there are five basic categories uh, of. Uh, I, I just asked down the insurance, but um, I think that the rest of them are variable. All right. I think that registration and taxes may be independent of how many miles you drive. When you talk about like the property tax and the... Uh, I thought it went down by the years, the year of your vehicle. It does, but the year of my vehicle won't change based on how many miles a year I drive it. So you're right that over time the, uh, the registration costs are lower. But I, in any given year I can drive a lot or drive a little. Okay. And so what I said was that for me, the purchase price, registration, and tax are fixed. Now insurance is variable because you know when you get a car insurance quote, they ask you how many miles a year you drive, and it, it'll change a little if you drive a lot versus drive a little, but it doesn't change a, it doesn't change much. You know, like a car 12 years, let's say even if you're 16 when you buy the car, mm -hmm. you're uh, 26, 28 years old, uh, you, know, you might have kids that, I mean, uh, if you have kids, your liability insurance is going to go through the roof. If they're driving, it's they're, well, even if they're 16 and living in your house and not yeah. driving your vehicle. You can basically draw everything but the liability. As a but the, the activity oh, level sorry. isn't how what year and time it is. What we're talking about is how many miles per year is being driven. And so insurance does change a little based on if you drive a lot or drive a little. And of course, the variable costs include the fuel, because the more you drive, the more fuel you're going to burn. Maintenance expenses can go up if you drive a lot and you're having to replace tires and change the oil more often. And so that gives us some experience classifying the different types of costs, both the ice cream example and buying a new car example. So I would love to keep paying 20 cents, 26 cents a mile, but the, uh, the Dodge Intrepid is starting to get rust on it and you can't have your wife drive a rusty car. Just, let, let me give you some advice. If you're not married yet, you can't have your wife drive a rusty car. Especially when you're driving a Miata that doesn't have any rust on it. It's shiny and everything. How do you get away with that? 
with kids. I just, oh well, you know, drive one at a time in the car. <laughs> All right, so here's a, a look at what the costs would be um, on a visual basis if you have some of them being fixed. So some of the expenses don't change as a function of how many miles per year you drive. And so maybe this line would represent the expenses associated with the, uh, the annual purchase price spread over the 12 years. Uh, this is including the cost of uh, registration and taxes. But then the total cost, this top line represents the total cost. And so these are the fixed costs. The total cost goes up as the number of miles per year is driven. In this example, it was a linear relationship because you know, the more gas you use, uh, there's a direct relationship between um, increasing miles driven and increasing In the homework that you do, by the way, uh, you're going to be asked to come up with some, to draw some charts that look like this. You know, just draw a little graph of the variable and fixed costs over time. There are other ways that we can classify the costs um, into recurring costs, which will happen um, more than one time. And so a recurring cost for the ice cream store could be that every month they have to pay for um, milk, or every month they have to pay for uh, their rent. A non-recurring cost is something that doesn't happen on a regular basis. And so it might be that once they buy a freezer for the ice cream to be stored in, that that, that cost is paid for and it doesn't happen on a, a repeating basis. Um, direct costs are ones where you can specifically say how much of it goes into, how much cost goes into producing a certain uh, good. And an example of that in the case of a cold stone, you can say how much milk, how much sugar goes into producing the ice cream. But if you think about an indirect cost, that's something where you don't necessarily know the relationship between those expenses and what's being produced. Uh, if you think about the uh, the cost of um, have, having an accountant. You know, how much accounting cost goes into a single ice cream? It's tough to relate the two because it's not a direct ingredient of the product. And so some costs here at Marshall are classified as indirect. When I bring in money from an outside agency to do research, uh, let's say that the Department of Transportation gives me money to study how water is eroding foundations of their bridges. They'll give a certain amount of money to the project that I can spend on supplies that I need, and that's considered a direct cost. The cost of my labor, the cost of um, running experiments or direct costs. But then Marshall keeps some of the money for indirect costs. And what they use that indirect cost money for is the electricity. Uh, they use it for computers. They use it to pay the salary of the secretaries who place purchase orders. But it's tough to say how much electricity goes into my research project, or it's tough to say how much uh, secretary time goes in. And so the, the distinction between direct costs and indirect costs is when you're making something or doing an activity, you can estimate how much of direct costs goes into that activity. But with an indirect cost, it's more difficult to allocate it to a certain task. All right, so that is it for today. Let me give you this homework assignment. And uh, you can begin on this immediately, in fact. Certain of the things that are in here, you won't actually learn until uh, the remote lecture that we're going to have for tomorrow or on Wednesday. Now remember, you need to check your email because I'm either going to send you a link with a, uh, a link to a video file to watch tomorrow's lecture, or I'm going to let you know that it's posted on MU Online. So don't come here tomorrow at 9. We're actually doing a, uh, a different training in this room. So no class tomorrow, but I will see you at 9 o'clock on Wednesday. And you need to watch the lecture before you come to class on Wednesday. All right, hope you have a great day.